Let's go ahead and compute the correlation function for the asynchronous binary signaling random process now. So we need to compute Rxx of t1, comma t2, which by definition is the expected value of x at time t1 times x at time t2, which I can write like this. This is x of time t1, and then x at time t2, the only thing I need to be careful is I need to use a different counter variable right here. That's the only thing I need to be careful about. And I can write down x of time t2 like this. I've replaced all the t's with t2's, just like we're supposed to. So this is the expectation that I need to do, which I can write like this. Instead of having a sum times a sum, I can just refactor that into having the double summation, so I haven't changed anything here. And then, how to approach this gets a little tricky, but here's how we're going to do it. We're going to divide it up. What you can think of is this double sum for some fixed value of n, we loop over all pa possible values for m. So if, say n is 7, we loop from minus infinity to infinity on the m variable. And then n goes to 8, and then we loop from minus infinity to infinity on the m variable. Every time we have a fixed value of n and we loop over m, there is one particular value for m where m equals n. So for instance, when this is 7, eventually we get to m equals 7, and all of this stuff in here matches up in terms of m equaling n. So the way I'm going to kind of rewrite this is I'm going to rewrite this double summation, which has a lot of terms, in terms of kind of the diagonal elements. This, this accounts for all the times when m equals n, plus all the non-diagonal elements. So most of the terms of our sum are over here, because most of the time n is not equal to m, and I have them being different. But this part right here accounts for all the times when n and m are equal to each other. When that happens, I have a n times a n, which is a n squared, whereas over here, they're always different. It's always a n times a m. The reason this is nice to do is because that simplifies this part of the computation over here quite a bit, because when I bring my E operator inside, I end up with the expected value of AN times AM, which we said are independent random variables, so it factors, and we've already determined that the expected value of AN is zero, so this is equal to zero. So really, all the kind of off-diagonal terms go away due to their expected value being zero. So that's kind of why it's nice to break it up like this because this all goes to zero. Now let's go back to this first part. Let's bring the expectation operator inside. So I'd end up with the expected value of an squared. Well, what values can an squared take on? If an is equal to a, an squared is a squared. If an is equal to negative a, then an squared is also a squared. So the expected value of an squared is always a squared. So I can rewrite this first part now like this. I can bring the a squared outside. I've already taken the expected value. Note also what I did here. This is a random quantity, and also inside the rectangular pulse functions, we have the random quantity d, but a, n's, and d are independent, so I was able to do these expectations independently. So I've already taken care of all the expectations with respect to a. Now I just need to worry about the expectations with respect to d. So really, if I was going to do this expectation right here, how would I do that? I would take everything inside the expectation, and I'd put it inside an integral, and then I would integrate with respect to d. d goes from minus t over 2 to t over 2, so those would be my limits. And then I'd have to multiply by the density of d, which is a uniform density. So that's, that's one way I could do it. What we'll find, though, is it's going to be easier to do a little change of variables here. So instead of integrating with respect to d directly, we're going to do a little change of variable to average over d. So instead of averaging over d directly, I'm going to do a little change of variable. I'm going to replace this quantity with what I call alpha. So alpha right here is still a random quantity because it has d in it. So that is alpha. Since I'm trying to introduce this random variable alpha, I need to know how to replace the limits of the integral with respect to d in terms of alphas. So the bottom limit of my original integral would have been minus t over 2. 
When d is minus t over 2, though, alpha is equal to this, because I've replaced minus 2 over 2 right here to figure out what the corresponding alpha is. So this tells me what the limit will be, the lower limit of my integral with respect to alpha. What about the top limit of the integral with respect to d? The top limit was originally t over 2. If I take t over 2 and plug it in here, I can figure out what the corresponding value for alpha would be. So this is going to be the new top limit of my integral with respect to alpha. And then finally, this original integral with respect to d would have had a d d in it, right? The differential with respect to d. I need to get rid of that and replace it in terms of alpha. So if I differentiate this with respect to alpha, I get d alpha is a negative d d. So these are all the pieces that I need to substitute d variables for alpha variables. So I've got this swapped out. I've got all my integral stuff swapped out. The only thing I really haven't swapped out is this. Well, that's not too hard to figure out. If I take this equation and rearrange it a little bit, I can get this very easily just by putting the t2 on the other side. And then if I rearrange this a little bit, I see that t1 minus d minus nt, which is this right here, is equal to this quantity. So now I've substituted out this piece right here as well in terms of alpha. All right, so now I'm ready to kind of rewrite all this. I have a squared, the sum over all n, and the expectation is an integral, right? That's what an expectation is. We've just done the work already now, though, to get rid of d's and write it in terms of alphas. So if I replace all those quantities with their alpha components, here's what I get. 1 over t is the uniform distribution, right, because it's uniform. And then my simplified integral now looks like this, because I've substituted all the d quantities out for alpha quantities. So this is what I need to integrate. So let's think about that. The integrands here, one of the integrands is the rectangular function of alpha over t, where alpha is the, the variable that we're plotting against right here. So this really is what I've plotted. Al the pi function of alpha over t is this centered black line, whereas the part over here, alpha minus t2 minus t1, that is a time-shifted version of the rectangular function. It's been shifted some amount t2 minus t1. So here in my little sketch, where I've sketched it in orange, I've assumed that the quantity t2 minus t1 is a positive number, so alpha minus a positive number shifts it slightly to the right. So as I'm doing this integral over alpha, what I'm really doing is I'm multiplying two rectangular functions, and I'm adding up the area that they overlap. Okay. If t2 minus t1 is 0, then this second function here isn't shifted at all, and they completely overlap, right? However, as t2 minus t1 gets larger, they overlap less and less and less and less, and the amount of overlap gets smaller, so this integral gets smaller. Eventually, if I shift this second function enough, if t2 minus t1 is large enough, eventually they don't overlap at all. Well, when do they stop overlapping? When this orange rectangle shifts far enough to the right such that its back edge doesn't overlap with this front edge at all. Well, that happens when t2 minus t1 is greater than capital T. When I've slid this an entire pulse width to the right, I don't have any more overlap. So eventually we get zero overlap. Okay. Another thing to think about in this integral is this integral is always over some amount capital T. So we're always going to integrate over alpha over some interval T. If you look at the lower limit and the top limit of the integral, for T2 and n being fixed, we always integrate from minus t over 2 to t over 2. So this integral is always an integral over length t. Given t1s and t2s, there's only one value of n that gives us a non-zero integral. So we have this sum over all n. So I need to do a whole bunch of integrals of this stuff, right? But guess what? Only one value of n actually gives us a time window that encompasses where these things actually exist. All other values of n um, give us limits on our integral that don't encompass where these actually exist on the alpha axis. 
So if you sketch that out for a few cases, you can convince yourself of that. But basically, once we've set t1 and t2, out of all infinite number of integrals we're going to do here, all of them are zero except for one particular value of n that happens to encompass the right amount of, or the right region on the alpha axis that is the region where these rectangular functions exist. Okay, so if you take all of these comments into fact about how the overlap decreases as t2 and t1, that gap increases, and the fact that we really only have one integral here that's non-zero, you can write down what this integral is. It's a squared times this times this pulse function. So what is this first part? This first part right here just accounts for the overlap that we talked about. As t2 and t1 get bigger and bigger and bigger, the overlap goes down and down and down. So we have this linear decrease in the amount of overlap. And that's exactly what this 1 minus accounts for. So that's exactly what this accounts for here. And then this accounts for the fact that once our gap gets too big, once t2 minus t1 gets too big, there is no overlap and everything goes to zero. So really this is just kind of an indicator function to let us take care of the fact that once t2 minus t1 gets bigger than t, it turns off. So this is kind of a crazy looking integral, but if you reason through it and note these facts, this is what this integral turns into. Notice that this equation right here is only a function of t2 minus t1. So guess what? Let's go ahead and define tau as t2 minus t1. And that means we can write now finally our correlation function as this. a squared times 1 minus the absolute value of t over, or tau over t times the pulse function. So you notice I all of a sudden threw in this absolute value sign. Up here when I did the math, I thought about it only being a shift to the right. That was all my reasoning here. I thought about this just shifting to the right. If you do the same reasoning and have it shift to the left, you get basically the exact same answer. So we didn't really do that case about it shifting to the left, but all this logic and math, it turns out to be the same thing. And then you can combine those answers by just using the absolute value function. So we end up with an autocorrelation function that looks like a triangle. Its peak value is a squared. As tau gets big, it linearly decreases in either direction. And then eventually, once tau is greater than capital T, the autocorrelation function goes to zero. And this seems like a reasonable thing. Remember, the random process itself has these pulses that have a width capital T. Once I have slid my random process so far such that my pulse is now completely within an adjacent pulse, we know that those adjacent pulses are completely independent of each other in terms of amplitude. Well, that's exactly what our autocorrelation function is telling us. It says if we slide greater than capital T, we have no correlation between anything in our random process. Also, if I don't slide at all, what do I get? Well, I just get kind of the power of my baseband pulse shape, A squared. And as I slide it just a little bit, the overlap goes down and I linearly decrease to zero. So this seems like it's a reasonable result because we know if we slide enough, we now have pulses that overlap that are completely independent of each other. And we know how the independent works out as we toggle between minus A and A. So that wraps up our computation of the autocorrelation function for the asynchronous binary signaling waveform. Definitely quite a bit more complicated, but this is a very practical kind of binary comm signal that you see, and now we know how to describe its autocorrelation function.